¡Bienvenidos! ¡Comenzamos! Instituto Nacional de Perinatología, Ética y Humanismo Buenas tardes, sean todos bienvenidos al Auditorio Samuel Cashmer. Me da mucho gusto tenerlos aquí este día para esta gran conferencia magistral. Eh, mucho gusto, soy la doctora Verónica Flores Rueda, jefa de Programas Académicos y Educación Continua del Instituto y en nombre del doctor Jorge Arturo Cardona Pérez, director general, y de la doctora Viridiana Gorbea Chávez, directora de Educación en Ciencias de la Salud, les reitero la bienvenida. Eh, la coordinadora de esta sesión magistral es la doctora Verónica Saga Clavelina. Ella es investigadora nacional nivel 2, investigadora en Ciencias Médicas E, y es adscrita al Departamento de Inmunobioquímica del Instituto. Eh, nos va a, a presentar a nuestro profesor del día de hoy, nuestra ponencia. Adelante, doctora Vero. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Es un gusto ver a tantos estudiantes. Eh, bueno, eh, el día de hoy tenemos la fortuna de tener con nosotros al doctor Franco Marmenon y también viene acompañado por otro gran investigador, el doctor Bo Jacobson. Por favor, les pido un aplauso para ellos aquí. Ok, eh, lo primero que vamos a hacer es, les voy a platicar muy, muy brevemente sobre la, eh, la trayectoria del doctor Menon y por qué es tan importante que, que, esté, que esté aquí con nosotros hoy. Y también eh, vamos a platicar, eh, voy a darle la bienvenida ya después en inglés y ya va a comenzar con su presentación. Él está feliz de ver eh, que hay una gran cantidad de estudiantes, quiere escuchar sus preguntas y él estará todo el tiempo hasta que todas las preguntas sean resueltas. Ok, bueno, vamos a comenzar. El doctor Rankuman Menon es profesor y director de la División de Investigación Básica y Ciencia Translacional en el Departamento de Obstetricia y, Ge y Ginecología de la University of Texas Medical Branch en Galveston, Texas. Tiene múltiples líneas de investigación y este fue un gran reto resumirlas, así es que eh, espero haberlo hecho bien. Él trabaja sobre la respuesta inmune y tráfico de, de células inmunes en la interfase materno-fetal humana. También eh, tiene proyectos relacionados con el desarrollo de múltiples modelos tridimensionales como organoides de coriodecidua humana hechos por, por bioimpresión para evaluar el efecto de múltiples drogas durante diferentes condiciones en la gestación humana. Eh, también está interesado en conocer el papel y el impacto de la senescencia de las membranas fetales humanas en la señalización del encendido del trabajo de parto. Eh, otros de sus proyectos tienen que ver con eh, la evaluación de contaminantes ambientales y el impacto que estos tienen sobre el desarrollo de la placenta utilizando modelos de órganos en chip. Eh, también trabaja con otros modelos de vesículas extracelulares como vehículos para eh, transportar drogas, eh, bueno, medicamentos eh, y biomarcadores predictivos para el desarrollo de parto pretérmino y preeclampsia. Eh, también trabaja con microquimerismos de células fetales y sus consecuencias sobre el corazón y el pulmón materno. El doctor Menon es desde el 2006 un colaborador de la Organización Mundial de la Salud y del Preterm Birth International Collaborative y su trabajo ha permitido consolidar la comprensión a nivel mundial de varias cosas. Gracias a él podemos entender ahora mecanismos de estimación del trabajo de parto, la identificación y validación de biomarcadores eh, para el nacimiento pretérmino, la identificación de asociaciones genéticas en parto pretérmino. Eh, también está interesa es, es parte del proyecto eh, Genoma eh, de Nacimiento Prematuro y el proyecto de biomarcadores de parto pretérmino. Es asesor y consejero de tesis de más de 50 estudiantes de pregrado, posgrado y especialidad y además es revisor de innumerables revistas indexadas. Tiene varias patentes y son muy interesa es muy interesante esto porque es el ejemplo de cómo podemos pasar de la ciencia biomédica básica a hacer medicina traslacional. Aquí hay una enorme cantidad de alumnos de medicina y este es el ejemplo perfecto de cómo podemos utilizar el conocimiento obtenido en los laboratorios y usarlo para sus pacientes directamente. Entonces, el doctor tiene varias patentes, les voy a describir eh, tres patentes, las más, las más recientes. 
Eh, es coinventor de un kit de diagnóstico de ruptura prematura de membranas usando la actividad proteasa en saliva. Eh, también eh, tiene otra patente que permite determinar el riesgo de desarrollo de parto pretérmino en una muestra sanguínea de la madre mediante la identificación de marcadores proinflamatorios secretados por membranas fetales y placenta. Y finalmente también eh, eh, tiene otra patente para... Eh, hacer uso terapéutico de exosomas capaces de expresar IL-10 para reducir, prevenir y retrasar el parto pretérmino. El doctor Menon tiene 272 artículos internacionales hasta hoy en la mañana, eh, 12, 12, 12 capítulos de libro y tiene un índice H de 76. Eh, como saben, este es un índice que marca el impacto personal de la investigación que hace cada uno de los investigadores en el mundo. Ok, bueno, dear Dr. Menon, welcome to Mexico again. Uh, this, uh, on behalf of Dr. Arturo Cardona, director of the National Institute of Perinatology, uh, per, Perinatology sorry, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation to give this lecture and share your work and contributions with us. Uh, this institute is devoted uh, to caring mothers and babies with the highest risk of preterm labor in Mexico. All researchers, clinicians, social workers, and students in this auditorium are interested in this mother's current tendency to understand much better and prevent trade this condition, which in Mexico alone affects more than 200,000 of babies and mothers per year. Uh, bienvenido a México, Dr. Menon. The stage is all Gracias. yours. De nada. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's such a great honor to be here today and honored to be in the city for the first time, uh, honored to be a part of uh, this team here, honored to be invited to this, uh, to give a seminar here, and truly uh, a challenge to present in front of you that uh, the huge task that Dr. Saga has put on me about how we can understand preterm birth, how we can take steps towards solving the, the problems of preterm birth. So once again, thank you for having me here and thank you for the kind invitation to give this talk. And Dr. Saga has put in a lot of effort uh, in organizing this event and she's been, I know that she's been nervous also in, in, in putting it all together. But uh, once again, I would like to, uh, to, to thank you for doing a wonderful job, not only inviting us here, also organizing the Preterm Birth International Collaborative Meeting uh, the last three days here in the Mexico City, inviting people from all around the globe and organizing a wonderful, successful meeting here. Thank you. So um, I'm a reproductive biologist, and uh, it's... Uh, my interest is pregnancy and parturition, and those who of us who are in the field of obstetrics, whether you are a clinician, whether you are a scientist, whether you are a nurse, whether you are a nurse practitioner, whether you are a midwife, whether you are a resident, whether you are a fellow in the field of obstetrics, we all want happy and healthy pregnancy. But as you know, 10 to 15 percent of pregnancies do not and happy and healthy because of the complications of premature birth. We are truly honored to have Dr. Bo Jakobsen here today because in May, he published this report or under his leadership, a team of organizations and a team of investigators, team of leaders in the field of perinatal medicine and other maternal women's, maternal and children health, neonatal health, pediatric health, put together a report called Born Too Soon. This is actually a second report that was published back in 2011, which was released by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And that is an action report, what measures we should take to reduce the rate of preterm birth around the globe. 
that first report that published in 2011 estimated or sometimes guesstimated the rate of preterm birth around the world. Dr. Jakobsen's team, uh, what they have done is they reviewed what we have done in the past 10 years to solve this problem. And they came up with the rate again, and they also came up with what next measurements, measures that we have to take, what next steps that we have to take to curtail the rate of preterm birth around the globe. Unfortunately, the rate of preterm birth remains about the same 10 years ago versus now. But I really wanted to give a, a, a round of applause to Dr. Jacobson for the measures that they, his team has taken. And we are truly honored to have him here in the audience. This is such a coincidence that he happened to be here in Mexico City while I'm doing this lecture today, seminar today. So preterm birth, uh, as we know that it is less than, th that's arbitrary definition is less than 37 weeks of gestation with a live birth, 13 million babies are born around the globe a, a year prematurely. And there are a million of these babies do not see the first birthday because they die because of complications of prematurity. Uh, if they survive, the 12 million that survive will have lifelong disabilities and adult, and they will also experience adult onset diseases. In the last decade alone, 150 million babies born preterm. So if you think about the, the, the two born too soon report, we have 152 million, and these rates must go down in the next decade or so. And what I'm going to do today is what steps that we can take from a basic scientist point of view? What are the measures that we can take to, to improve clinical trial options that how we can get to the patient? And when you get to the patient, we also have a question. Who is the patient? Is the mother the patient or the fetus the patient? Who are we going to treat? Do we treat both of them or do we treat one of them? How do we treat them? How do we measure, take measures in the lab in vitro, in, 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 in vitro environment, basic science environment? What can we do technologically to provide much better uh, uh, solution for the uh, solving preterm birth problem? So again, this is coming from Born Too Soon report from Dr. Jacobson report. You can see the rates are uh, stunningly high in many parts of the world including developing country, developed nations, well-developed nations like United States, which has about 10 to 12 percent of preterm birth. Mexico is not different, about 10 percent preterm birth in Mexico. Uh, so we are all in the same boat on, on solving this problem. So let's see why can we solve the problem? What are the problems that we are dealing with with preterm birth? Why cannot we understand? Why cannot we reduce the rate of preterm birth? So many of you are medical students, you're probably going to be an obstetrician at some point. You can see that there is, this is the, the final mechanism that leads to preterm labor. That is pathobiological pathways leading to preterm birth. As a clinician, you're only dealing with preterm labor, a subject coming to your cleaning with preterm labor. That is too late to intervene because the process of delivery has already begun. So that's the clinical dilemma. As a clinician, you are dealing with the patient that's already in labor. But you don't have time to go back and think about how, how did it start in this patient? Is it because of infection or is, it, is she obese or is she a smoker? Is she a, 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 a have behavioral issues or environment is bad? So on and so forth. A clinicians do not have time to think about when they get the patient in their ward to treat. The, any of these risk factors. Now, adding to the complexities, preterm labor is not a single disease. It is a combination of multitudes of diseases. And you can see in that second circle that I put, there are so many diseases that can lead to the same effector terminal pathway that leads to an inflammatory condition, oxidative stress condition, leading to preterm labor. Now, the complexities do not end here. If you put another layer of complexities that are called risk factors, and the last circle that you have there are what I call static risk factors. These static risk factors do not change the course of pregnancy. For example, ethnicity of a subject, genetics of a subject, behavioral patterns of a subject, environment and they live in, socioeconomic status of a patient, None of these things change during the course of pregnancy. There may be subtle changes can happen in some cases, but 
And overall, in the majority of the cases, these are not going to change. So these static risk factors can cause, in a, when you put that in a pregnancy environment, when the, the subject become pregnant, these static risk factors can work with the pregnancy and cause dynamic syndromes, that is diseases that you are seeing in the inner circles, they all culminate into that final effector pathway leading to preterm labor. But as a clinician, you don't have time to think about where it all started. And it is not a single factor. It can be a complex multitudes of factors. So this is the complexity of uh, preterm labor. So as a basic scientist, my goal is to understand from a mechanistic point of view, how these all things can lead into that final faith pathway. And my uh, lab is interested in looking at fetal membranes or amniochorionic membrane, which is the innermost lining of the uterine cavity, which is called the bag or the sac, which protects the fetus inside, which forms the fat, it is where the amniotic fluid, so it is like a, a, a sac-like structure with amniotic fluid, the baby resides, the fetus resides inside, and that's the area of interest for my lab. Now, let's look at the pathways leading to, uh, to normal labor. There is a physiological activation that needs to be there in order to time the pregnancy or delivery. That means, how, do the mother, how does the mother know that it is time to deliver the fetus? Or how does the fetus know that it is time for me to come out of the mother? So there should be a timed, it is a timed event. There is a biological clock mechanism that is going on between the mother and the fetus. There is a constant communication between the mother and the fetus. We need to understand that communication. When there is a communication is failed, it can potentially lead to premature labor. So fetal signals, when the fetus is mature, that means all the organ systems in the fetus, the kidney, the brain, the heart, the, the, the skin, anything, the liver, uh, the lung, all of the things, when it, they are all mature, that the fetus is mature, that is the time to deliver. But how does the mother know that the fetus has matured? All these mature organ systems release certain biochemical factors into the amniotic fluid, and these, is, these signals are propagated towards the mother. And most of these signals are inflammatory mediators, and that information and oxidative stress that build up in the amniotic cavity will lead to cervical ripening or birth canal opening, myometrial contraction or a uterine muscle contraction, which is called labor, and eventually leading to delivery. Now, this can happen before 37 weeks with all the risk factors that I showed you in the previous slides, that pathological activation can also cause the same machinery to operate leading to preterm delivery. So what we wanted to know, if you look at, oh, now, if this is the pathway, if this is the dogma uh, that leads to labor in a premature condition, we might be able to treat this because we know who is activating it. We know how the tissue, what the tissues are. So let's try it. These are the interventions currently used for uh, preterm labor. There are antibiotics to treat infection. There are steroids to cause uh, anti-inflammatory functions or maturation, maturation of uh, 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 lung. Uh, there are antioxidants, progesterone, well tried. Tocolytics, uh, 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 the most commonly used drug is tocolytics. And uh, there is, if you wanted to stop cervical ripening, there are several ways of doing that. Uh, lifestyle interventions are there, nutritional interventions are there. However, none of these are effective in reducing the rate of preterm birth. So, like I said, when the Born Too Soon report came out in 2011, the rate was around the globe was about 10 to 12 percent. It is still 10 to 12 percent. So that means none of the interventions that we are doing now are effective. So the question is why they are not effective. Are we treating the right patient? Are we treating the right mechanism? So my lab looks at it from a fetal perspective. I look at it as a fetus as a patient. And uh, most of the current interventions are designed to treat the mother. Most of them do not reach the fetus, partly because the placenta is a major barrier. The it, will, it will not let the drug cross the placental barrier. Even if it does cross the placental barrier, it can be teratogenic. So any drug that you try in the lab, in that we try a lot of lugs in the lab, but it can never reach the FDA, the Regulatory Affairs Committee, 
to try this in patients because none of them have effective uh, we do not if we are not able to claim that these are efficacious it will protect the fetus it will deliver the fetus uh, at term and it will not have long term consequences when the baby is is uh, is growing so i wanted to show you how a bench scientist can take a a biological mechanism or a biological pathway how can we design a drug to to uh, from our studies and how can also we develop a drug delivery system to the fetus that is safe and effective so i'm going to show you two examples today how a bench scientist can help the clinicians in the in the in the ward in the hospital in terms of dealing with uh, uh, with preterm labor so again this is not the ultimate model or anything i'm just giving you as many of you are phd students here postdoctoral fellows here medical students here if you end up doing research i'm just showing you a pathway that you can take a bench scientist pathway to a bedside practice okay so um how can we select a drug how do we choose a drug to treat preterm birth how do we select the target which is the target that is causing preterm labor what is the target molecule if you get a tissue if you get a problem that tissue is having what will you intervene there in that tissue do you just get rid of the tissue or do you target a particular molecule how do we do that how do we get the drug to that tissue those are the the few things that i'm going to discuss today like my model is fetal membranes which is the amniochorionic membrane which is the innermost lining of the uterine cavity here is the the structure this cartoonic version of the amniotic uh, amniochorionic membrane the amniotic cavity is here this is where the fetus is this is where the amniotic fluid is and the multi layered fetal membrane so there is an amnion layer which is also shown here amnion layer is a single layer of epithelium then is a, a green what you are seeing here is the extracellular matrix and dr philippe wario ortega who is here in the institute he has worked extensively on this tissue and looking at how matrix degrading enzymes can uh, cause uh, uh, disintegration of this membrane um so that uh, uh, the the matrix matrix contain mesenchymal cells or stromal cells and then there is chorion trophoblast cells so these are the layer of the amniochorion and it is lines with maternal decidua so there is a feto maternal interface that you are seeing here that is the the uh, one of the barrier function so anything come through besides the placenta fetal membrane acts as a major barrier between the mother and the fetus it will not let anything go towards the fetus either so this is the tissue that i use in my lab so when we looked at a term labor women who delivered vaginally at, at term without any complications of pregnancy and women who had a cesarean section at uh, at term without labor we were able to show that the telomere length of the placent the placental membrane the telomere length is a biological measure of aging it actually start to decline if you take the fetal membrane at 22 weeks of pregnancy versus 40 weeks of pregnancy there is a gradual decrease in telomere length that tells me that the fetal membrane is aging in during the course of pregnancy that we were able to show that aging related uh, markers in the chorion and in the amnion in term labor but not term not in labor this was also associated with a stress signaling kinase p38 mac kinase it actually respond to any sort of cells as a stress in the amniotic cavity and if the stress signaler is activated it can potentially lead to aging and this is not just intraamniotic aging even adult aging happens through this mechanism if oxidative stress is there you can potentially can expect a p38 activation induced aging so it was interesting that term labor is associated with fetal membrane aging we were able to replicate this data in mouse models as well we were able to show that in mouse fetal membranes and placenta the telomere decreases p38 get activated as the gestation progress and the senescence also tend to increase so in humans and mouse models you can see that aging is a factor so aging starts in utero not at the, on the day of birth so if you think about it we are all 10 months older than what we by, uh, are chronologically are so aging starts in utero now the problem with age uh, that what why is aging is important because aging of the fetal membrane actually correlates with 
fetal maturation. So the, when the fetus is fully mature and ready to come out, that's when maximum level of aging or senescence is seen in the fetal membranes. Now, why is that important? Because senescence or aging is associated with massive inflammation. It is not just regu your regular cytokines like IL-1s or IL-6 or TNF-alpha. It also produces damage-associated molecular patterns like HMGV1. Uh, several other factors, a nuclear cell-free fetal DNA. All these things can be released. And now you have a mechanism that the fetus has built to tell the mother that I'm ready, I'm mature, I'm ready to come out. This signal has to be communicated to the mother. How will the inflammation go to the mother? Most of these inflammatory mediators that you see will be released into the blood, released into the amniotic fluid, but they have very short half-life. They may not go through all the layers of the uterine tissue to reach the myometrium or the cervix, which is the farthest end, to tell the mother that the inflammation is happening in the uterine cavity. So we hypothesize that these inflammatory mediators can be packaged inside an envelope and delivered to the mother. So the fetus can package them all inside something and delivered to the mother saying that, here is my inflammatory signal. Here is, I'm telling you that I can be delivered now. This is mediated by, we thought that this is mediated by extracellular vesicles or exosomes. Exosomes are particles that are very small, 30 to 200 nanometer particles. And they can be produced by any cell in our body. And they can release cargo, that is inflammatory enriched cargo or any cargo what the cell is making. Whatever the cell is making can be packaged inside the exosomes and can be delivered, can go through. And because, because it, these uh, mediators are inside the exosomes, they are much more protected. Their half-life is much more higher inside the exosome. So my lab hypothesized that this inflammation that you saw in my previous slide because of senescence or aging may be packaged inside the exosomes by the fetal tissues, fetal cells, and delivered to the mother in a protected way. And when it reaches the mother, uh, so these are exosomes again. Another the question that we asked is: Can a fetal exosome propagate from the uh, uh, from from the uh, uh, propagate fetal inflammatory signals. Can it reach the mother? So what we did is one of my graduate students took some fetal exosomes, she labeled them, that contains a lot of inflammatory cargo, like a senescence-related cargo. She injected in one horn of the, the, the mouse and left the other one, un, 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 uh, um, un, uh, this one was not uh, injected, this horn was injected. These are exosomes labeled with a specific dye. And when she imaged them, she can see that exosomes are there. She has delivered on one side, but not on the other side. So when she injected this exosome on the fetal side, she was able to observe that these exosomes migrate towards the, feet, the mother. So from the fetal side, exosomes containing inflammatory cargo can go from the, uh, from the fetal side to the maternal side. And we also want to know whether these exosomes can come back from the mother to the fetus. So we created a, a transgenic mouse model which contains this particular construct, gene construct. That is basically two, two, uh, two fluorescent dyes. This, the, this particular gene tag has what we call a TD tomato. That is a red fluorescent tag. And it also has a EGFP or green fluorescent protein tag. So you can see that there is a green fluorescent tag and a, a red tag. It also has a, a site where you can cleave that. So if you cleave this place, that if you release the red, you retain the green. So we have this thing, which uh, this, this is cleaved by an enzyme called cyclic, cyclic recombinase, or, or uh, that's what you're seeing in this paper. So this paper is already published. You can get the details from this paper. So we, what we did is, what my graduate student did is, she took a male mouse that contains this particular construct, gene construct, so all the tissue, all the cells, everything that is released from these cells are, are red. And she made it that male mouse with a female mouse that is wild type, has no color. So what she was able to do is she created a bunch of pups that are red in color. So whatever that comes out of that red mouse is red exosome, red cells, everything is red. 
So we looked at maternal blood. She took maternal blood and looked at fetal exosomes coming to the maternal side. She was able to see that approximately 15% of the exosome in maternal blood during pregnancy are fetal exosomes. Now, she wanted to prove that it goes the other way too, mother to the fetus. So what she did is she put exosomes containing CRE or cyclic recombinase. So you know that that CRE will cleave that, release the red, uh, red dye, it will now start fluorescing into green. So she started putting exosomes containing CRE into maternal blood. Her hypothesis is that these CRE will go towards the fetus, cleave that gene construct in these red pups, and it'll turn green. And that's exactly what she saw. Not only she saw that she, the, she was able to convert the red pups into green pups, the green pups started releasing green exosomes, and the green exosomes started coming back to the mother. Now she was able to show that 15% of the, the maternal blood has green exosomes. So the, what does that mean? It means exosome can traffic between mother and the fetus. They can carry signals from the fetus to the mother or mother to the fetus. So extracellular vesicles or exosomes acts as communication channels between the fetus and the mother. So that was a good uh, uh, thing for us, and we were also able to, I won't get into the details of the, the things that we have already, uh, the scientific details, but it's already published that we were able to show that exosomes can cause premature labor. If these inflammatory cargo-enriched exosomes were injected into the mouse, they can potentially cause premature labor. So what is the utility of these exosomes? They can be used as biomarkers. So if you know that fetal exosomes are coming to the mother, if you can isolate them during the course of pregnancy, you can study what is happening in the fetus. And you can also use those exosomes. You can package drugs inside that exosomes and deliver in the mother, deliver to the mother because it can cross over the placenta and reach the fetus. So those are the two things that, uh, so but I'm going to, what I'm going to do today is how we use exosomes as drug or drug delivery vehicles in this uh, uh, model. So just to summarize what, uh, what you're seeing here, so, sorry. So on, the, on, on, your, on your left, you're seeing a normal physiological labor. Oxidative stress start to build up in the intraamniotic cavity. It leads to senescence, P38 activation and senescence. On the right, what you're seeing is prematurely, all these normal physiological signals are replaced by risk factors that the mother may have. All these risk factors can activate the exact same pathway, leading to premature senescence, premature inflammation, premature fetal inflammatory response, causing preterm labor. So the model that we are using now is, whether it's physiological or pathological, leads to P38 activation, senescence of the fetal membranes, release of inflammatory mediators. These mediators activate NF-kappa B, which is a pro-inflammatory or transcription factor. It also activates neutrophils and macrophages and other immune cells to the fetal membranes, what we call chorioamnionitis, and many of you are in the audience are doing chorioamnionitis-related research. So this is one mechanism how we get chorioamnionitis. All these inflammatory mediators are now packaged inside the exosomes. These are uh, envelopes containing messages. These messages are now going towards the mother, telling the mother that I'm ready to come out either physiologically at term or pathologically at preterm. Mother does her own job. Now mother starts to activate her own inflammatory cascade, uterine inflammation, cervical inflammation, eventually leading to labor and delivery. So our model is, can we use this same thing? Can we reverse this and provide exosomes containing drug to the fetus so that we can treat the fetus? So how do we select this? So, so our Going back to one more thing, we are selecting NF-kappa B as our target molecule. So this is how we got NF-kappa B as our target. Now, NF-kappa B target is not something new. There are several labs used NF-kappa B as a target. There are several compounds to inhibit NF-kappa B, but none of them, none of them made it to a clinical trial because cytotoxicity of the compound. There is no way to deliver it to the fetus. 
There is no good way of administrating them. So there are several problems. So we, our job is to overcome these limitations. So how can we overcome these limitations? We have to come up with an alternate approach to deliver an NF-kappa B inhibitor to the fetus, which is the patient. So we went back and see what will be an ideal uh, anti-inflammatory molecule will be. And we went back and looked at some papers that we published almost 30 years ago. Interleukin-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. This anti-inflammatory cytokine is, is a, is a, is a, it will shut down NF-kappa B. And we knew that. We knew this 30 years ago. And we even had a patent back in 2002, again, uh, 21 years ago, we had that patent. That patent expired. And we tried to form a company to, uh, to, to, to market this IL-10, but no, no takers. Nobody will buy it. Nobody will ma make it. Why? Because it has to be injected intraamniotically to have effect. effect. So clinicians like Dr. Jacobson here, he's not going to use it because he's not going to put multiple doses of IL-10 into the amniotic fluid to treat preterm labor. We have to get IL-10 to the fetus in a much more efficient, effective way rather than doing amnio, amniocentesis. Here's another paper that showed that fetal, I, that's from Dr. Saga, that uh, IL-10 is an anti-inflammatory molecule that you can actually uh, use as an, uh, uh, to, to reduce inflammation. So what do we do? We took some fetal exosomes. We, uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Kamala, what he did is he opened these exosomes by electroporation. And electroporation opened the bilayer exosomes and he inserted IL-10 into this. And see whether we can have, now you have an exosomes containing IL-10. So by electroporation, he was able to, to in, include IL-10 inside these, ex, uh, uh, these fetal exosomes. He did a, a, a plethora of tests to make sure that electroporation did not ruin either, um, either the exosomes or the, the function of IL-10 inside this. So you can see that several tests, the, the size did not change by electroporation, and the shape of exosomes did not change because of electroporation. Uh, the markers of exosomes like CD9, CD63, CD83, this is the CD81, CD63, these are some of the markers that exosomes have. We want to make sure that they don't change because of electroporation. It didn't change because of electroporation. And what you're seeing in blue here in the bar uh, uh, is IL-10. So we know that IL-10 is encapsulated inside these exosomes. So will it show cytotoxicity? That's the number one goal. We don't want fetal cytotoxicity. When we looked at fetal cells with EIL-10 or exosomal IL-10, we didn't see any cytotoxicity. We also did some in vitro experiments to make sure that EIL-10 or exosomal IL-10 is effective in shutting down inflammation. So what you're seeing is when we treated these cells, both maternal cells and fetal cells with LPS, with this a bacterial antigen, we got L uh, inflammatory cytokine increase. When we treated with EIL-10, you can see that all of these uh, levels were coming down. So EIL-10 was able to shut down inflammatory activation in maternal cells and fetal cells without causing any cytotoxicity. Well, this is in vitro model, easy to do. Can we replicate that in an in vivo pregnancy model? The in vivo pregnancy model, we have to create a mouse model of pregnancy where we actually in introduce E. coli vaginally and deliver them in different doses and we were able to sh make sure that there is a dose of E. coli that will deliver live pups with intraamniotic infection. If it is not live delivery of pups, it is not really preterm birth. The field that, including myself, has traditionally made mistakes by injecting LPS into the, uh, in the, into the uh, peritoneal cavity, and you get preterm birth. But problem is, fetus are dead. That's not preterm birth. If you look at the WHO definition of human preterm birth, you have to have live birth. So our major goal was to create a model with live delivery of pups. So we were able to identify an optimum dose of E. coli that can cause ascending infection and preterm delivery. We gave the drug EIL-10 at different doses and on day 15 of pregnancy, and we were able to show that E. coli, of course, caused preterm birth. When we injected E. coli and EIL-10 together, 
it prolonged gestation. Remember, it is not term delivery. It's still preterm delivery. Prolonging gestation is what we are trying to do. It, we always prolong gestation up to 48 hours in mouse models. That is equivalent to almost a month in humans. So that means if current uh, uh, drugs that we are using in preterm labor for stopping preterm delivery will not give you that kind of extension of gestation. So it is quite promising. We were able to show that it also shut down NF-kappa B activation. It shuts down, uh, as shown here. It also inhibits a, a compound that actually splits NF-kappa, cause NF-kappa B activation. So in multiple ways, EIL-10 can stop NF-kappa B activation, reduce inflammation, and delay preterm birth. So exosome as a drug delivery vehicle has promising uh, uh, future. It can carry drugs. It can carry drugs across the placenta. It delays uh, infection-associated preterm birth. Uh, we looked at, I'm not, I haven't shown any data, but we didn't see any long-term consequences in the live-born pups. So that means EIL-10 is not causing uh, massive immune suppression and the fetus is doing, I mean, the, the neonates are doing just fine. So it is a novel approach to treat preterm labor. Now, there are more evidence needed beyond this. So if you go, if I go with this data to FDA, immediate rejection. There is no question I will get rejected. I have to show that in multiple different ways that this drug is still safe to deliver in human uh, body. This are mouse. This is not human. So we have to show that in somehow in humans. Not a single clinician will attempt. I will not get an IRB approval to put this drug in human. I have to show this in a humanized model. So what are the humanized models that we currently use? We have cell cultures, 2D cultures that we do all the time. We have organ explants, fetal membranes, placenta, organ explants. Many of you here do that. We have animal models like mouse, sheep, monkeys. All of these are available, but none of these are truly mimicking human pregnancy. So how will we do this? Now the advanced technology have organized. You can actually create the whole fetal membranes from human cells. And you, or you can create the whole placenta. Or you can 3D bioprint. And all of these things are done in my lab right now. And some of the students that are uh, visiting from here are actually involved in doing developing these some of these uh, uh, some of these models so you can 3d print fetal membrane you can 3d print placenta so you have using human cells or you can have lab on a chip or organ on a chip so what you're seeing on the top here is a placenta on a chip and this is fetal membrane on a chip so i'm going to talk a little bit about the fetal membrane on a chip and then i will com combine the two and say how the the inter um, maternal fetal interface can be reproduced. So what is an organ on a chip or a lab on a chip? It is actually a platform. It simulates organ. It is not putting placenta on a slide. It is not putting fetal membrane on a slide. It is actually simulating the organ using cells from human, placenta or human fetal membrane. So it's a biomimetic system connected by, intra, uh, by microfluidic, uh, microfluidic microchannels, and they're all interconnected you recreate the architecture of the tissue on a, on a platform that actually mimics the function of the tissue in, in, in vitro. So the organ is recreated using human cells on a small platform. So a chip, uh, so what we have, the field has advanced that the entire human is on a chip now. So you can, it's all connected. You can study a human physiology using a human on a chip. And you can see the size, just the size of a palm, the entire human being. So we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to recreate human fetal membranes on a chip. And what this is using four different uh, uh, circles. And these are all interconnected through micro channels. So there is communication between them. And each layer has different cell types. So you take the amnion uh, fetal membrane, oh, sorry, fetal membrane architecture and recreate them on a chip like this. Each, uh, each circle will have different cell types. So starting with the outer layer, that is the blue layer will be amnion cells. The innermost green will be deciduous layer. So the maternal fetal interface is recreated. Now you can study the fetal membrane as is in a humanized model. So after forming all those things, we were uh, uh, thankful to the NIH that we got funded 
to create a clinical trial on a chip. So that's why we are developing new drugs. We are developing new platforms. We are testing them using these platforms. So my, my colleagues, Dr. Lauren Richardson, who is the brain behind organ on chip in my lab, and Dr. Camella, who is actually a reproductive pharmacologist, they created a placenta on a chip. They created fetal membrane on a chip. But you know that they always are together in, in, inside a human pregnancy body. So it has to be interconnected. So what they did is they reconnected those two and created a multi-organ chip. So both the maternal fetal interfaces are now on a single chip. And that particular circle is, can fit in a six-well plate. So it's about this size. Um, and, uh, and, and you can have up to this particular model has about seven different cell types representing the entire placenta, maternal decidua, the entire fetal membrane. And we were able to show that cells can grow here. These are humanized chips, human cells, human pregnancy cells. And we have published a lot of uh, papers using this model. This is the latest drug that we tested statins. Can statins be tested on using this, this chip? What they did is they used the chip, sorry, it will go back. Using this chip, they tested the efficacy of statin. They tested the propagation of statin from the maternal side to the fetal side, metabolism of statin, and in different cell types, different cell layers. All of them were tested as efficacy of this drug, safety of this drug, cytotoxicity of the compound that being tested, everything that you needed to prepare an application for FDA has been done using this chip. This is using statin as a model. And what they did is they compared that with what happens if you do an animal model using the same drug, same dose? What if you simulate this using an artificial intelligence using human clinical trial data? They did that. And they, of course, did the human uh, organ on chip, and they found something like. Now what we wanted to know is how does our multi-organ chip mimic what is happening in a human body? What you're seeing is here is there are multiple ways. What is the propagation rate of statins in different models? The gastroplus, which is the artificial intelligence, tells me that 18% of the drug will transfer to the amniotic fluid to the fetus if in a clinical trial, based on a clinical trial data. That's exactly what we got in using our fetal membrane placenta organ on chip model. So the fetal membrane or multi-organ chip, humanized chip, replicated uh, a data that is reported by clinicians during their clinical trial in a statin, uh, a statin clinical trial. We have developed multiple organ on chip for the entire pregnancy. For each organ, we have now a chip, including fetal brain. So we can study cerebral palsy now. Uh, all these chips are available, and the, all these chips have different, uh, you can use it for different applications. These are all in the, in the making now. I think uh, the, the United States Health has a buzzword now, what is called New Approach Methods, N-A-M, New Approach Methods. This is going to resonate in the next 10 years that you want to get away from, go away from animal models because that are not resembling human pregnancy. It is all, you can also uh, say non-animal models or N-A-M again. No, new approach methods or new non-animal models. Humanized organ chips represents new approach methods or non-animal models. So in summary, humanized chips can reproduce healthy and diseased states of the fetal maternal interface. It uses human cells, so it is humanized. It can model different trimesters. It can model, reproduce different, model different trimesters, reproduce different trimesters. It can replace animal models uh, or reduce the use of animal models in the future in our trial. With that, I want to thank my team. I mean, I don't work in the lab as much. I mean, this is a dedicated team of scientists, uh, faculty, students, postdocs. They work hard in the lab to produce, so my thanks to them. And all the funding that we have received over the course of years to develop these organs on chips, and we continue to pursue this avenue. That, I wanted to thank you again for the invitation and thank you all for listening to me and for the wonderful audience here. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Menon. Uh, now 
are we going to answer some questions? Uh, Dr. Anna Jansen, please. Dr. Molina. Uh, 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 give First, me a minute. Sorry, just give me a minute. If, uh, si, tienen, si quieren hacer una pregunta en español, por favor háganla y nosotros la traducimos y traducimos la respuesta que el doctor dé. ¿Ok? Adelante, doctora. First of all, thank you, Dr. Benham, for your speech. And uh, I have two questions, or maybe more, but I, I will do two. Um, the first is the chips, it's clearly an approach for human uh, um, testing drugs and pathological processes. But in this context, how is the approach to research the delivery of exosomes into the fetus to um, uh, use it as a molecular approach for preventing uh, early delivery? Yeah. Uh, good question. So the, you can, you, what I showed you is an example of how we did the statin trial. We have already done the EIL-10, exosomal IL-10 trial. It's already ongoing in the lab. We have a, a publication under review right now. Uh, I didn't get into the details of that study here because of the time limitations. So you can introduce any drug, whether it is a chemical drug or a biological molecule like exosomal IL-10. You can test the same thing. What we have able to show that EIL-10, if you introduce that to the maternal decidual compartment, that's where the maternal fetal interface is. Decidua supplies the, the blood and the nutrients toward the placenta or the fetal membrane. So when we introduce EIL-10 to the decidua, it propagated in both directions, that is placenta and fetal membrane. And then we created a disease model. We put some E. coli in there. E. coli propagated, started producing inflammation on the bait, both maternal and fetal side. Then we introduced EIL-10. It was able to reduce that inflammation. So, and the cells still survive after that uh, infection, uh, inflammation. Yes, in fact, my, my concern is regarding the efficacy of delivery, because in organites you put there the exosomes and drugs and everything, but the efficacy in vivo must be different. I suppose, I don't know. Uh, I agree with you. So the efficacy in vitro, what we are seeing in a model. So we're trying to replicate what might be happening based on the physiology of human. The, the architecture of the, 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 the structure that you see on organ and chip is mimicking what is in vitro. I mean in vivo, in mm -hmm. utero. Yes. Okay. So the second thing is you cannot completely get away from an animal model efficacy testing. That's why we initially did the mouse model to show, we actually went backwards. We first pro showed that the animal models, we can reduce preterm labor. We even got preterm delivery in this model. And now we wanted to prove that this drug is not cytotoxic. It will pass through the, it will pass through the fetal maternal barriers. So there are certain questions that you can answer. You can do efficacy testing by measuring cytokines or whatever that you want to do. Your question is absolutely right. Is that equivalent to stopping preterm labor in humans? No, it is not. You still have to do some animal studies to show that it is efficacious in that regard. Yes. And my other question is regarding the cargo of exosomes during uh, a normal delivery or preterm delivery. Uh, does someone has actually see inside exosomes and analyze them as omics uh, techniques to show which is the cargo between, I don't know, uh, diabetes, maternal diabetes, and other yes. inflammatory processes? Yeah. There's quite a few actually on gestational diabetes. I mean, one of my colleagues and a great friend in the exosome field, Carlos Salman at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, has published a lot of papers on placental exosomes in diabetes patients. And he has projected that these cargo, proteomic cargo and mirinomic cargo, miRNA cargo, can be used as biomarkers of prediction of placental health in gestational diabetes. And we can do the same thing. I have shown that in preterm birth, in spontaneous preterm birth, 
the exosome cargo changes in each trimester. We were able to create a predictive model using exosomes, fetal exosomes, as early as first trimester placenta, I mean, first trimester pregnancy. Placental exosomes are good biomarkers of, based on the cargo. So you're right, I mean, exosomes can be used as a cargo, and that may be what we will use before we start putting this drug into humans. We wanted to identify who is at risk and who will benefit by getting EIL-10. Now, the good thing is, this is such an inert molecule. It doesn't stay in the body for too long. It gets cleared so, so fast. It also non-immunogenic. You can actually put mouse exosome in humans. You will not see an immune reaction. You can put human exosomes in mouse. You still won't see a human uh, immune reaction. Most of our work in, uh, in mouse are done with human exosomes. First of all, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Menen. My question is, what more could we, could we be looking forward to regarding drug development to decrease the rates of preterm birth? And if so, will the treatment be mainly based on anti-inflammatory molecules through the use of exosomes? Can you repeat that question again? I, I, I got the last part. <laughs> Let me repeat it. What more could we be looking forward to regarding drug development to decrease the rates of preterm birth? And if so, will the treatment be ba mainly based on anti-inflammatory molecules through the use of exosomes? Uh, that may be a good question for Dr. Jakobsen here, so if he's, <laughs> if he's still around. Uh, no, I think that uh, if you look at the preterm birth model, whether it is spontaneous preterm birth or preterm birth due to some other condition, uh, premature of the membranes, there is a very strong inflammatory component. So inflammation is clearly one of the triggers of labor process. And uh, what Dr. Jacobson has shown in multiples of his own studies is uh, fetal inflammatory response. That is the major culprit, not the maternal inflammation, the fetal inflammation. What we are not doing now is not treating the fetus, but we treat the mother. It's not reaching the fetus. So yes, I firmly believe that if we can control fetal inflammatory response using an anti-inflammatory, it doesn't have to be EIL-10. Anything that is not cytotoxic will not cause any problem to the fetus or long-term immune suppression will benefit. Now, why we use EIL-10? Because, again, it's a natural molecule. Your body makes it. We are just supplementing an additional dose of EIL-10 that is not there during inflammation-associated preterm birth. So you're actually supplementing a little bit extra. So we hope that that approach may work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Doctor, let me, let me confess now that I'm in love with your lab, <laughs> really. You. And I, I, I want to ask something about your, uh, your experimental model with mice infected with uh, Escherichia coli, and that you have told us now that, that you have performed that in that uh, lab and achieved uh, uh, models. Uh, I, I have seen that when you when you try the E. coli with uh, gentamicin, it doesn't work as the IL-10 function to reduce the time, or, or well, to, to prolong pregnancy, and that's that's uh, perfect as uh, as as we know now. Uh, this inflammatory response is, is the leading cause of this preterm delivery, but also this inflammatory response is is uh, induced by uh, by the body for control the bactericidal effect of Escherichia coli. So, in that in that uh, scenario, do you think that you can also make an extra treatment after the IL-10 um, um, introduction with some antibiotic, or does it has to be done in the same exosome? Or, or, or what, what do you think? Because your patient yeah. is infected. <laughs> excellent, excellent question. So I didn't get into the detail. I had that data. Okay. I showed the data, but I didn't explain it. Uh, you're absolutely right. Number one, inflammation is a, a requirement for pregnancy maintenance. Fetal growth, placental growth, membrane growth uh, all require a, a, a level of inflammation. But what we have is immunohomeostasis. That means that it's all balanced inflammation. When that inflammation becomes an overwhelming inflammation, whether it's on the maternal side or the fetal side, it leads to pathology. Mm -hmm. okay? 
So your question is, in an E. coli model, we were able to plug, actually in that model, we were able to get it to term with the EIL-10. Well, how did we get it to a term? With antibiotics. So if, if you administer, EIL-10 is not gonna stop bacteria from multiplying. You really have to control bacterial uh, multiplication, right? So when we administered gentamicin with EIL-10, we were able to make it to term. So yes, EIL-10 is uh, strictly an anti-inflammatory agent. It will not have any effect on microbial invasion. But you, you use it at the same time. In the same exosome, you had the IL-10. No, uh -huh. no it, uh, we haven't put gentamicin or any antibiotics inside the exosome. Antibiotics is given IV. Uh -huh. Exosomes are given IV in a different. So exosomes contain only IL-10. It does not have antibiotics. But gentamicin, it, it, cross, it crosses. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's shown. Yeah. Now, the, the, other, the other interesting fact here is if you give gentamicin alone, you know, gentamicin is in clinical use right now. If you have intramniotic infection, gentamicin is given to pregnant women. It has zero effect in pre stopping preterm delivery. Why? It is not just the infection that is causing preterm labor. It is the inflammation, the, the consequence of infection. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Manon, for your conference. Uh, my question is regarding the in silico models. Do you think that in a future, especially with the boom of artificial intelligence right now, in silico models may come to replace new models like the organ on a chip because they are so precise? Yeah, I, I believe so, because uh, we are actually trying to combine the two. You know, we already have the two system independent. We are in the process of combining the two and see whether we can have a much better predictive model based on, so your question, you know, how do we know that, yes, it's propagating, it is not cytotoxic, it is shutting down information, will it stop preterm labor in a real human? And that, that can be predicted using an artificial intelligence approach. So yeah, of course. And if there are anybody smart people in this audience who has that skill, so let me know. I'm happy to have you. Mi pregunta es si en algún futuro las, el, se puede tratar al feto una enfermedad específica, o sea que el endosoma reconozca, ya que pasó toda la, la senta y todo eso, reconozca la enfermedad específica en el feto y se pueda tratar desde dentro. Okay, she asking if is in the future we can treat uh, to the fetus uh, before, before before uh, he warms uh, with a specific treatment uh, for any kind of disease uh, during pregnancy in the future. Any trimester? Yes. Uh, can you treat during any trimester? Yes. Of course, yes. yes. I mean, the, the challenge here is you have to identify who is at risk uh, before we can treat. You know, you don't want to give randomly. I mean, you have several prior factors. I mean, prior history is a good indication. So if you know who is at risk, of course you can initiate a treatment. So prophylactically, you can give EIL-10. Again, it's an inert molecule. It's exosomes and IL-10. Both of them your body makes. So prophylactically, if you do it in a good high-risk population, it very well may work. Okay. And it's not just infection-associated preterm birth. Any inflammation associated adverse pregnancy outcome, whether it is miscarriages, stillbirth, rupture of membranes, preeclampsia, all of them may have a beneficial effect because this is going to control inflammation. Thanks. Thank you so much for the information. It's a very interesting topic. And my question is uh, what could be the point of no return to administrate these uh, vesicles? Because uh, I think that maybe in a, in a woman, uh, it's difficult to know where is the time that you need to stop the inflammation for the fetus. Obviously, you can measure many symptoms in the mother, but as you say, you are trying to focus in the fetus inflammation. So uh, do you think that maybe this training could not be effective if we don't deduce what is that point? Uh, can you repeat that last part, please? Uh, do you think that maybe this treatment uh, could not be effective 
if we don't deduce what is the point that you should to administer it, because yeah. maybe you administer it, but the inflammation is overwhelming or everything. Yeah, where there is no point of return. I mean, your question is, again, if you are getting a preterm labor, like if you remember that circles that I showed, where a clinician is actually dealing with a woman with preterm labor, which is full-blown inflammation, is it possible that you can intervene at that stage and revert it back to a, a, a non-inflammatory, non-labor state? You know, that's a very good question. That's where we want it to be. I mean, if, because as long as we do not have a biomarker to predict who is at risk for preterm labor, we are dealing with patients presenting with labor. That is the only time you can intervene. Unless there are indications for choriamnionitis or some kind of infection going on in the, in, in the, in the, in the mother. If you can predict that, again, that becomes her, she becomes a high risk group. You know, so unless you can identify a high risk group, I'm not really sure how efficacious will be if a woman is in full blown labor and her cervix is already dilated. Will he be able to prolong? I want to believe yes, but I have to try that in humans and, 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 and see it. Okay, and I, want, I have one more question. Um, what about that, uh, the possibility that the woman reject these uh, extra vesicles? I mean, uh, you should to create uh, uh, vesicles from their own uh, maternal cells because I think that maybe it could generate a rejection. Of course you can, but you don't have to because uh, there, is, there is no difference. But like, there is no even interspecies difference. It's not a, an issue when it comes to exosome. So you don't really have to have the exosome come from the same patient to, to be treated. You can have any cell line making it, uh, uh, and uh, from even male, for example, and it's not a big issue, big deal. So it it, can, it it like I said, it is coming from animal to humans or humans to animal doesn't make any difference. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. They are non-immunogenic. That is the beauty. Mi duda es si si existe alguna dosis máxima que en vez de dar beneficios empieza a dar efectos adversos. Si se ha visto algún efecto específico que dé más beneficio, que dé más, más, o sea, que empeore la, el, la enfermedad. O sea, de la inyección, si existe algún, alguna dosis máxima que en vez de ayudar, empeore. Ah, ok. Uh, uh, she, she asked if there is any uh, maximum concentration of EL10 that you can use before this uh, is not good for the, for the system, it's uh, yeah. worse the system. So yeah. what we are using now is about 500 nanogram per ml of IL-10 in, in our exosomes. That is the dose that we are using. And that's good for in vitro and in vivo studies, animal model studies. So it has to be tailored to the human dose eventually. Now, you know, it, it's not a big deal actually because IL-10 is in clinical use in humans for rheumatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease. There are several inflammatory conditions currently treated with recombinant IL-10. Now, why can we use recombinant IL-10, that, that drug that is already in market in pregnancy? It will not reach the fetus. Recombinant IL-10 has a very short half-life. So you give it to mother, mother may benefit, the fetus will not benefit, it will not cross the placenta. So it has to be, that's why we are encapsulating this in protecting that in the exosomes. So the dose is already available. You know, using the artificial intelligence, we might be able to predict what dose will be benefit, what will, dose will benefit a pregnant subject. Thank you very much for your great talk. It, it has been really very interesting. Regarding your mouse model injected with IL-10 and E. coli, and, and also a previous question. I was just wondering, have you tried to put inside the vesicles besides the IL-10 also like, I don't know, antimicrobial peptides maybe or something like that to, to inhibit the complete immunosuppression? Immun and how do you avoid 
the degradation of the vesicles, the rapid degradation of the vesicles of the insusum. Yeah, so both of the, no, we haven't tried the, any other antimicrobials. You can potentially include an antimicrobial peptide in, in the uh, exosomes as well, antimicrobial proteins. Antimicrobial drugs, you can incorporate it in, uh, uh, in the exosome as well. Do you need it? Is, uh, is, uh, what is the best way to deliver that uh, drug is the, is the question. So right now our model does not include antimicrobial inside the exosomes. Uh, we only include uh, anti-inflammatory IL-10. We actually have another drug, I mean, which is a, it's another NF-kappa B inhibitor that we have already tied and published, and it's, it's already undergoing clinical trials in acute kidney injury. So it's called super repressor NF-kappa B. It's an anti uh, NF-kappa B inhibitor that we incorporated in the in the exosomes. That works very well. That the problem with we don't believe that that's not a natural compound. I mean, so the IL-10 is more natural. You know, it's much more easier to deliver IL-10 than a, another compound. The question about stability of exosomes. They're not that stable. In the body, they can get cleared pretty fast. So if you, when we tried our mouse models, you know, the kidneys are already loaded. When you, the minute that we inject, I mean, after six hours later, you can see them in the kidneys, maternal kidneys. So they are on the way of elimination. So now, but we do see efficacy. We do see the drugs all the way to the fetal brain. So that tells me that, yes, in a short amount of time, these exosomes can reach fetal brain. So, yes, and, um, you know, will it have efficacy there to stop syndromes like cerebral palsy? It has to be tested. But, yes, they are stable but not stable. You may have to have repeat doses. Dr. Mean, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I would like, here. Oh, sorry. I, I would like to ask you about uh, regarding of how do you do the follow-up on these patients treated or these models treated with uh, exosomes with IL-10? Have you done in your different models uh, regarding in, in vivo or like trying to simulate a, a treatment in humans about different uh, factors that could activate this uh, pathological pathway of the uh, activation of premature birth? For example, what you were talking about, diabetes or, or infection. So how would it be the yeah. difference between the follow-up in two different cases. Would it be uh, a longer or like till the mother is ready to the normal birth um, process? Or how, how do you do this follow-up? Yeah. This is what FDA will ask me. They don't care about preterm labor prevention. FDA wants to know, uh, you know, Food and Drug Administration, the regulatory agency, they want to know whether the, the new NH has a problem or the mother who received the drug has a problem in the long run. So we have tested that in, in mouse models already. What we did is that we uh, let the, the pup that delivered live after infection, after treatment, who delivered live, we kept them for several months, I mean several weeks, and challenged them with LPS, E. coli actually, E. coli. So that means if there is a massive immune suppression in these animals, they won't respond. They will actually have sick animals with E. coli infection because their immune system is already suppressed because of EIL-10 treatment. We don't see it. it. They behave just like a normal animal. We tried that in the same thing in the maternal. Mother was challenged with E. coli, no, no immune suppression. So in order to prevent infection in those models, those pups that are neonates or the mothers, we have to give additional drug. It doesn't have a lingering effect. Now, the other question is transgenerational effects that you, you know, will they have preterm birth again? That has to be tested. We haven't done that. There's a transgenerational, transgenerational effect is yet to be tested. And now some of these things that this is why pharmaceutical industries don't want to touch pregnancy because in order to create a, a, a stable data, safe data that they can believe, it takes years, 10, 15 years to get some data that the, fee, the child is behaving normally after getting treated during pregnancy. Seven, eight years, follow up. No pharmaceutical industry want to invest that kind of money for that prolonged period of time. Um, we know that he, we know that health syndrome um, has cer certain maternal mechanisms, uh, but also a placental mechanism. 
So can we use these exosomes um, to transport like antibodies like TN? Absolutely. Yes. For the treatment and uh, the other question is um, if we can treat uh, from any trimester, uh, can we prevent the the um, la the develop of health syndrome even? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried that. That will be a good hypothesis for you to test. Thanks. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first is that, do you know uh, how is the uh, opt uptake mechanism of these exosomes uh, into the uh, target cells? It's uh, through a receptor mechanism or something like that? Yes, so it can be two ways. Num uh, it could be that, let's say EIL-10, exosomes containing IL-10. It can be the exosomes can release IL-10 outside the cell so that IL-10 can bind to its receptor and get in and have the function. Or exosomes can be taken up by the cell by endocytosis and release the cargo inside the cell. So IL-10 is released inside the cytoplasm. So we have looked at both. We have looked at how it works, the mechanistically, how IL-10 works. It's actually two different pathways. In both pathways, we see the same effect, the NF-kappa B inhibition, but the mechanism or pathway leads to NF-kappa B inhibition is different if the IL-10 is released outside versus IL-10 released inside. But we get the desired effect. Now the question is, the challenging question is, what is more beneficial? releasing it outside or releasing it inside? Or are they, are they the same? Okay, um, thanks. And the second one is, uh, if uh, you can uh, tell some advice about the exosomal isolations. Uh, for example, uh, it's better ultra centrifugation or, fa of, or uh, sorting fat or something like that. Uh, what do you know about, about Are you talking about the exosome isolation? Uh, exosome? Uh, exosomal isolation. Isolation. So all our approaches with the, the EIL-10 prep that we use for our, our studies are ultra centrifugation. Ultra centrifugation followed by uh, purification, uh, chromatographic purification. Now, we're not overtly concerned about the size of these exosomes at all. Because as long as we can package them in a vesicle that can go through the placenta, that's all our goal. So it doesn't matter whether 300 nanometers or 30 nanometer particles. However, we use ultracentrifugation. Now, my lab is now shifting to a bioreactor approach because we wanted to make large quantities of drug. So what we are using is a tangential flow filtration. So you can use, you know, 50, 500 ml or, you know, fire, uh, two, three liters of cell culture media to isolate exosomes using tangential, tangential flow filtration. Mm -hmm. uh, here, doctor, over here. Yes. Um, well, before anything, as everybody said, thanks a lot for all the information. I'm, I'm very, pretty sure that we, it's, it's very valuable for all of us. Then, um, as a medical student, I, I need to ask this because I believe that it's a concern for every, everybody here. Um, um, ethical concerns, right? And my question is whether if you believe or not that uh, alongside with these new models and these, these new experimental approaches, that I believe we, we shall be favoring in this case, um, if you believe that this might be uh, taking us to a new level of ethical concern uh, consideration because we, we could obviously uh, want to help patients in, in general to, to favor the advance of science and technology, but at, at what cost, right? So if, if you believe that there is coming with these new models, many new ethical concerns to take into account. Yeah, no, this is absolutely, this is the, the challenge that we all face when we are in the process of drug discovery, drug delivery, drug testing. You know, in human, I mean, pregnancy per se, that pregnant women are therapeutic orphans. They are never involved in clinical trials because of these ethical con concerns. There is no valid data to show that Drugs that are taken by pregnant women 
are crossing over through the placenta and either benefiting or harming the patient. So most drugs are not approved for clinical trials, right? So there is an ethical concern. So this is why we decided to go all biological. Exosomes coming from the mother or coming from the fetus, IL-10, which is a recombinant natural cytokine that we already have, can it have a much better way of convincing the regulatory agencies and uh, may get approval? You know, it is a, it is a, it's a major challenge in the field, and we are all dealing with it. As the last three days, we've been discussing about how to overcome these challenges. Now, exosome as a drug has already been approved by FDA for certain terminal diseases like cancer, pancreatic cancer. So MD Anderson, where I am at in Houston, uh, has already a GMP-grade drug manufacturing facility to make a miRNA-based drug uh, for treating pancreatic cancer. You know, those are easy to get because there's no drug. I mean, it's a terminal disease. Pregnancy, it, it's a major hurdle. Okay. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Hi, doctor. Uh, well, first, thank you for, for your talk. It shows real expertise. And I, I love your point of view for focusing on the fetus. Uh, I find it admirable. Uh, well, my first question is, uh, knowing some of the risk factors that mother have for preterm birth, and thinking that you've already administered um, IL-10 exosomes, how would you know the mother is uh, not at risk anymore of having preterm uh, pre birth? Or would you have to give IL-10 during all of the rest of the pregnancy? Good question. So uh, although I look at it from a fetus as a patient perspective, I don't ignore mother as a patient, OK? And EIL-10 given maternal as IV to the mother, is go to the mother's system yeah, first yeah. before it reaches the fetus. So the mother is taken care of before the fetus. So we have looked at all the maternal tissues, uterine tissues, the myometrium, decidua, cervix, uh, uh, you know, the entire uterine, lower uterine, upper uterine segments. We see that massive inflammation reduction with EIL-10. So yes, the mother is benefiting, the fetus is also benefiting. What we were able to achieve that both mother and the fetus as patients and, and control information. Prior uh, treatments are restricted to mother, current treatments. Current treatments are restricted to mother, not reaching the fetus. But like, how would you know the, the mom is not at risk anymore from preterm labor? Would you uh, measure something in the blood or just continue giving it prophylactically? Yeah, so you have to monitor the mother. That, you know, giving the drug doesn't uh, eliminate her from her risk factors. So as the question, previous question, will you give antibiotics? Absolutely, you have to give antibiotics. Yeah, EIL-10 will not solve infection. Now, if she has behavioral issues, if she's a cigarette smoker, you know, having EIL-10 uh, will not stop her from smoking, right? Yeah. So the, you have to take measures to 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 identify the risk the mother has that led her to preterm labor. You know, the risk caused fetal inflammatory response. So we can, if you can control the maternal risk, which is a must, by controlling fetal inflammatory response alone may not stop her having further preterm labor. Okay, thanks. And my second question is real fast. Sure. Um, do you think uh, IL-10 exosomes could be used in emergencies, like when the mother is already in preterm labor, clinically? I want to say yes, but <laughs> that may be a question to the clinicians. You know that uh, it, it, I, I don't know how they will do it. So, but you wanted to answer that question. It's asking if, if you have an anti-inflammatory drug like EIL-10, and a woman is full-blown labor and inflammation. Do you think that you will give that drug to that patient and will it benefit? And, and, and you're referring, um, of course, to, to preterm delivery in this situation, not that term. And, and I'm, I'm quite skeptical. There is a kind of perspective of keeping, I mean, for the tocolytic part of the drugs that we are using, the problem is that maybe the baby is best of coming out because the, it might be an inflammatory soup within inside that is very dangerous for the baby. And we know that inflammation in the uterus is connected to, for instance, cerebral palsy. 
um, I think that uh, in the long term that in anti-inflammatory drugs has a very big importance in, in, in the prevention of preterm delivery in different ways, but we need to start early and when we are in the full-blown labor, I think that uh, I, I'm not there. So the short answer is no. <laughs> so my question is, <laughs> hi, I'm Paulina. Um, I'm concerned because many of the infections and many of the diseases in the mother can translate in the fetus. So between your experiments and labs, do you find something that we, we could use to inhibit this egg with this crosstalk between the mother and the fetus to prevent that maybe diabetes can cross and maybe HIV. So <laughs> maybe it's a, a big question, but... Yeah, yeah, no, it is, it's a good question. So, you know, for gestational diabetes, I mean, so let's take that example. You know, we're, you, first of all, we have to understand the pathobiology. Is it fetus it involved in it? Process. You know, gestational diabetes is most likely on the maternal side. There's no infection on the fetal side or anything, but placenta may be uh, oxidatively stressed because of diabetes. We know that. In preeclampsia, we know that the placenta has high rate of oxidative stress and inflammation. You know, it may not have infection of what we call sterile inflammation. Those sterile inflammatory conditions can be controlled by treatments like this. But it is, is it generalizable to any adverse pregnancy events? I'm not ready to say yes. Okay, so our model is so restricted to an infection-associated preterm birth, spontaneous preterm birth, which is about 50% of or more of preterm birth. So if we can make an impact in that area, we can start slowly looking into other areas, like, you know, HIV infection or diabetes or preeclampsia, hypertension, all that thing. But is, is it generalizable? I don't think so. I mean, the, the bottom line is, as a basic biologist, my goal is to understand what actually causes preeclampsia or gestational diabetes-associated placental pathologies. Once you know the placental pathology is such and such, then you may be able to tailor your interventions towards that pathology. That's the bench scientist's job, actually. Thank you so much for your wonderful lecture. And my question is, could you possibly use exosomes to introduce techniques like CRISPR into treating genetic diseases um, within the first trimester? Of wow, that's uh, it, the three, CRISPR introduction is already in place through exosomes. I mean, exosomes are used for uh, uh, introducing CRISPR to editing genes. That's already been tried, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, there are applications in front of FDA for approval. Now, will you use that in pregnancy in first trimester? I don't think this, these clinicians are ready for that yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, my question is, do you think it would be beneficial to introduce telomerase or any other anti-aging factors in order to preserve or to prolong the lifespan of the placenta in order to prevent a preterm birth? As, as the question is, you, will you introduce telomerase to in, expand that aging uh, so, or, 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 or slow down aging process? Yes and no. It is a good hypothetical approach. You know, it's a good, in, it, as a scientist, I like to try it. As a, uh, if, you, if you want that to be a translational thing, it's highly unlikely because you do not want telomerase to stick around because you want natural aging to happen. What you want to do is you either reduce aging-related pathologies or slow down aging through controlling MAP kinases, the P38 MAP kinases. That is, the, the, the telomerase approach it will be a bit more challenging. Thank you. Although I'm not an expert in that area, so you know, somebody who, is, who knows more about it, telomerase will do it. Okay, so thank you for your presentation, Dr. Menon. My question is, has the interaction between fetal microbiota and the presence of higher doses of IL-10 been studied? 
Can you repeat? I'm sorry. Yes, the interaction between fetal microbiota and the presence of higher doses of IL-10, uh, has it been studied? Uh, not studied yet. I mean, so the, you know, the, the first question is, what is fetal microbiota? Uh, and where is that microbiota? And uh, so IL-10, I don't think that it will impact microbial, microbial growth by any means. So my guess is it will not impact microbial growth or microbial metabolism or fetal microbiota development. If there is an inflammation associated with that process, that may be regulated. But then again, this EIL-10 is short-lived. It is not going to last there for days or weeks to, to completely change the microbiota. So you may have to have repeated dose to see that kind of effect. Um, good afternoon. My question is, how much time do we prosper in a future to observe uh, positive or negative effects on a human, and what cost or side effects may it have? The availability, or can we find it in private or public institutions? You mean the drug? Yes. Uh, not there yet. I mean, so if you look at recombinant IL-10, it's available. It's, uh, it's available and it's in clinical use. It is prescribed for uh, chronic inflammatory conditions. Now, this one to get market? I have no idea. I will start a company today if you have an idea about that. <laughs> um, yes. Hi, doctor. Thanks for your conference. Um, my question is the next one. In the future, could we use an schema uh, for the interval use of IL-10 to prolong the preg pregnancy, or will a single dose be enough? Single use, a single dose? Yes. So in our in vivo model, we had to use multiple doses. Multiple? Yes. So it we use three doses to prolong pregnancy all the way to term along with gentamicin. So we really have to have multiple uh, doses. Okay. Now, how often, how, uh, what dose is yet to be determined. Okay, well, thanks. And some of these, I mean, these are wonderful questions, by the way. And I'm not a pharmacologist, so I don't really know uh, many of how these drugs will work. And even from the pharmacologist's perspective, which I have a pharmacologist who is actually helping me with this work, this is new to them. This is biological drug. You know, it's not like a chemical drug, that like a statins. It's easy because a lot of data are available. You can predict based on the molecular structure. With biologicals, where is this EIL-10 going when you inject into mother? It can go anywhere you know, in the body. We don't even know where the, the, if, uh, uh, the adverse effect, if any, is happening in, in a tissue that we won't even think about. So the biological drugs have that challenge. Hi, thanks for everything. So I understand that the inflammatory mediators come from the shortening of the telomeres, but is there any way to slow down this process? And my other question is, what's next with this uh, investigation? Yeah, so yes, it will. I mean, so we, uh, again, I didn't get into the details of the data. The one thing that we were able to show is that histologic chorioamnionitis, which is one of the major determinants of adverse neonatal outcome was substantially reduced with the EIL-10. And this is precisely what I predicted, because I thought that fetal membrane inflammation is the trigger for preterm labor. And uh, chorioamnionitis is an indication for that fetal inflammatory response. We were able to uh, reduce it substantially. And what also, we also saw that immune cells, ILCs, innate lymphoid cells, were recruited to the membranes, and they actually produce IL-10. So when you give IL-10, there is a, a, a recycling process going on within the system that they make more IL-10, they bring cells that produce IL-10, so you actually create an environment where more and more IL-10 is produced internally. So you, don't may, you may not have to give a multiple doses or large doses of IL-10. You may biologically create a way to manufacture IL-10 inside, innately, which is what we want. What was the other second question? Um, what are the, the 
Oh, one next step. Next step is, uh, you know, show more efficacy of this uh, lack of any cited. There is, we are actually trying to f get some advice from the FDA in terms of how we can progress with this drug. Because no matter what we do, regulatory agencies are looking for specific things before it can go to a human trial, a phase one trial. So we're actually going to look at, uh, get some advice and feedback from them and then start phase one trial. That, that's the goal. Hi, doctor. Here. Uh, I, this question is related about the microbiome question you answered before. Uh, when you talk about two extracellular, about two vesicles, but we already know that there are a third, uh, the extracellular bacterial vesicles, make it by the maternal microbiome. And you talk about an infection model, but what happens? In non-infection models, uh, you interrupt the inflammation response, but what happened with the fetus, with the mice? Uh, they develop correct when you interrupt those inflammation? Uh, I question this because we know that it's necessary for the fetus to communicate with the bacterial microbiome. And so what happened with that? We, we don't see, again, we don't see an impact on maternal microbiome, or we haven't tested fetal microbiome, but maternal microbiome is not impacted at all uh, with, with this drug. I mean, of course, if you treat with antimicrobial agents, there will be a change in the micro, normal microbiome too. So what your question is, if you alter the normal microbiome, how is that going to impact physiologically pregnancy or the fetus? Uh, maybe Dr. Jacobson is the best person to answer that question. He has done a lot of uh, microbiome studies, but I don't know how, a, I mean, he has done a probiotic trials actually, uh, successfully on some of those things, but I don't think that the, the microbiome pattern change has been linked to, uh, well, let me take it back. Vaginal microbiome has been screened uh, extensively during pregnancy. And the change in the vaginal microbiome has been linked to preterm birth. So there is different classes of lactobacillus in different, you know, there's four or five different classes. One or two classes of lactobacilli are indicative of high risk status for preterm birth. And there are probiotic trials that have been done. I don't know about the outcome, but uh, maybe Dr. Jacobson will, will be able to elaborate. I don't think, and, and your question about the microbial vesicles also are very relevant. You know, so how these microbial vesicles can communicate with the fetus and how that impact fetal health, placental health, pregnancy health. These are wonderful questions. I don't have answers to. Yeah, um, speaking about the future, since this is a very new treatment, uh, do you think that it will be available for all pregnancies that suffer from preterm? or there will be certain characteristics that both the mother and the fetus will have to meet uh, either for IL-10 and the use of exosomes? I, I want you to repeat that question. I don't think I fully followed. When this new treatment comes out into the public and it's available for its public use, will there be, well, do you think that all pregnancies that are at risk for preterm label labor will be able to use it, or will there be certain characteristics that will yeah. exclude so them? So if it is publicly available, and if it is, uh, of course, it can, it's up to the clinician's discretion. I mean, how they see it. You know, I, I'm, this is where my lack of clinical knowledge you know, impedes me from answering that question. It has to be decided by a clinician at what stage of pregnancy, what stage of risk that they may consider this drug. So, you know, is it prophylactically pre-pregnancy? If, if let's say you have a, a patient or a, pre, a woman who is getting ready to be pregnant, he has behavioral issues or high BMI or prior history of preterm birth or vaginal, bacterial vaginosis. These are all high risk status, right? And this, you can decide that even before that she gets pregnant, she is protected. Will you give prophylactic EIL-10 uh, before she gets pregnant? That's a clinician's 
decision, uh, how they see the pregnancy will progress and what stage of pregnancy they think that, yes, she is developing, uh, she is becoming more and more risky. Her, her pregnancy is becoming more and more uh, high risk. They may have to decide at that stage. You know, this, this data that right now, I mean, those based on what we have, it's, it's no way, nowhere near to answer those kind of questions. Only human clinical trials will, will decide those facts. Thank you for, for your uh, excellent presentation. And my question is, uh, which are the advantages of using interleukin 10 over other an, uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines or mediators, for example, on TGF beta or uh, anti-inflammatory lipidic mediators? Yeah, um, so the reason why we used IL-10 is uh, historically, we have shown, we have shown, Dr. Zaga has shown, Many others have shown, Dr. Roberto Romero has shown, Dr. Uh, 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 Don Dil uh, uh, Diddley has shown that IL-10 is not increasing when there is an adverse pregnancy in the intraamniotic cavity. It is not changing. But what we need, but inflammation is going up. IL-10 is not going up to balance it. So if you supplement IL-10, you may be able to, to balance that pro-anti-inflammatory response. You may create an immunohomeostasis. That's the hypothesis that led to IL-10 as an agent. TGF-beta, we have tried TGF-beta as an anti-inflammatory agent. TGF-beta is also a pro-EMT factor. Okay. So, you know, epithelial mesocomal transition. So, I don't know whether TGF-beta is a, definitely an immune inhibitor. Will it have some adverse effect? Because it is a well-known EMT okay. inducer. It can be detrimental if you use something, but nothing stops you from testing any other anti-inflammatory agents. IL-10 is just a model based on our experience, based on our history, based on the literature. We thought that it will work, and it's already approved a clinical drug, actually, in many conditions. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So the safety is proven. Jacobson, uh, please. Muchas uh, gracias, sí. Thank I, I, it was quite amazing. So uh, Veronica may uh, ask me to do some final comments. But, but uh, I, I, uh, my intention was to ask you this, and maybe you can respond to it <laughs> instead. But first I want to say, uh, this was quite an amazing experience to be here together with you all. Um, I think that both uh, Dr. Mann and, and I are very jealous to have a group of, of of students and, and physician or, or to, that you, and you have been so active. I believe that you have made almost 100 questions here, at least 50. <laughs> and, and, and the questions were so amazing. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, do you agree? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I, I echo the comments. I mean, they're, they're yeah. Quite and, challenging uh, uh, questions and, and very I could, well. I couldn't. I, I'm at Gothenburg University in the western part of Sweden, and, and we are one of the top 50 university medical schools and universities for biomedical medicine in the world, we couldn't get a group of people like this to be so engaged. They will give, it would be 10 people turning up and there will be five questions or two <laughs> questions and then they want to go home. That was quite amazing and you should be very proud of you. I think that do you want to employ them all, or should I employ them all? <laughs> I would love to, yeah. <laughs> if I can. <laughs> yeah. So quite amazing. So all the compliments uh, to you for 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 this. Uh, Rom, uh, this uh, this we are talking about what we can do today and what we can do tomorrow. And and you have made an excellent talk that released this kind of all these kind of questions. Is there anything that we can do already now to? to really make a substantial difference in the preterm rate in, in the world, on the global stage, in Mexico, in Latin America? You may have answered that question yesterday yourself, that, uh, yes, stop delivering the barley. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> that's the best way. I mean, unnecessary uh, early deliveries can be can reduce uh, preterm births substantially around the globe. I mean, in many states in the United States, in some counties have 90% C-section rate at 34, 35 weeks. You know, do you need that kind of C-section rate? No. Uh, so th that's one thing. Uh, yes, I think that there are several things that 
we now know that we did not know 10 years ago or 20 years ago when we were young investigators and uh, and have that been made to practice probably not i don't think that we have done a good job at probably as the leaders of the field and uh, we have not integrated our knowledge into a clinical translational practice yeah, yeah. And that's where we need to take it. Yeah. And in the next 10 years, before you get the next born to soon report out, we should make an attempt to reduce the rate by at least 2% you know, yeah. two, reduction yeah. by 2% yeah. rate reduction. Yeah. And there are some things that you can do. And, and the Supreme Court in Mexico did a very important decision. Uh, was it this year or last year? Uh, that really opened up the possibility for a broader perspective on women's reproductive rights. Female women should be able to decide over their fertility, family planning, decide if they want to be pregnant or not. Why is that? That is because, because a wanted pregnancy is the most secure pregnancy. There are no medical rem that we can do that have that gives that. So female reproductive rights with abortion and with family planning is so important. Um, the other thing that is very important is the uh, uh, women's education, uh, basic education. You, uh, WHO, they, pro they, they promote uh, um, uh, universal health care coverage. That means that basic, basic health care should be part of the offering from the state. And, and, and that should include female reproductive rights. If you have a baby born too early, the family shouldn't get broke. That is so important to, to do. And also another thing that we in the report delivered that was so important, um, and, and that was respectful care that if somebody comes to the hospital or to the doctor, to the nurse, they should be, they should be met with dignity and respect for their concern. And, and they should, otherwise the people who need this doesn't come there. We should work together. We need to be, we who understand how important preterm delivery is, we need to step up and be global leaders, national leaders, regional leaders, to promote this. Because an investment in maternal and newborn care, that is an investment, it's not an expenditure. No se gasta dinero para investirlos en la salud materna y neonatal. Eso es un investment. It's an investment. And that is the thing that we need to go out. We need to go out and build a community together with the parents that have preterm birth. I have one, my oldest daughter is born preterm. We need to go out and build alliances and, and influence the decision makers in this. Meanwhile, we can do a difference now. That is the 2%, female reproductive rights. So uh, once again, uh, thank you uh, for the kind invitation. And so the uh, the questions have been so fascinating. And don't get me wrong; these questions are taken seriously. And many of your questions and opened up several questions for myself and my lab team. And I will take it back. And I will raise these questions to my students, my staff, my uh, junior faculty members. We want to address them in our research approaches because these are the, what you may think these are silly questions. No, these are the questions that we will face from FDA and other regulatory affairs if we want to take this drug to, to human trials. So fantastic questions. And Dr. Bo Jacobson cannot explain it any better than this because he has a, he said, I mean, the, the audience that I had is, is amazing. Very thrilled to do the stuff here and answer the questions. So yeah. I wish I had more answers, but you know, they're, they're too brilliant for me to I answer. I know. I know. Uh, well, thank you very much for 
to be here. We are really lucky. Uh, you, you have been very generous with us, with the students, and they. Uh, I always say that the only person that can be can make a difference are they. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, welcome to Mexico again. And muchachos, muchas gracias de verdad por estar aquí y por las brillantes preguntas que hicieron. Cuídense mucho y nos vemos en la universidad. Bye.